they felt that if it worked, you know, they didn't want to change it. But, um, uh, uh, you know, as I began my career, uh, it was a, a sort of like, uh, I, my career sort of paralleled the rise of digital animation. And what I always found kind of curious is where it's basically, how it just kind of, it almost seems to come out of nowhere. It's so ubiquitous now, and it's so around everybody. You can't, you can't do anything without some animation. In it. You know, it's like, it's like you know, online stuff and um, and visual effects in movies and um, uh, you know, uh, 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 visualizing for uh, science and technology, uh, flight simulations, games, stuff on the web, the internet. All of this is all CG, and and it's basically it's like, you know, how where did this begin? Where did it come from? And um, See, I, I, I remember as, uh, being a traditional animator, watching, you know, the, there'd always be the experimental people. And always you'd go to a film festival, and around 10.30 at night was a CG film. It was like the last film of the night. And everybody else was already gone to the bar, you know. <laughs> it's a CG movie, you know. <laughs> and, um, and, and then nobody could predict that this thing was going to just take over the whole business, you know. Um, uh, I was assist when I started at around 1977. I was assisting an old Disney animator named Seamus Culhane, and Seamus had animated the High Ho March in um, in Snow White and Seven Dwarfs, and it also animated a lot of um, uh, the Fox and Pinocchio. You know. And he was a wonderful old man. He's in his 80s, and but but he was always on top of things. He did some of the earliest TV commercials in 1948. And all. Uh, so anyway, it, uh, we were working on this technical film. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, he used to like to go to the New York Institute of Technology and go on a tour there uh, and, and, and visit where there was a scientist trying to put together the first graphics using the computer. And, uh, uh, and it was like kid engineers like Ed Catmull, <laughs> things like that. Um, and it was interesting, James came back to, to the office the next day and he was sitting there writing on his electronic typewriter. And uh, he looked up at me at one point and he goes, you know, computers are coming. They change everything. These things will never look the same. And I'm like, that's a nice old man. Why that? <laughs> Have some meat in <laughs> But he was right. <laughs> and it took over. You know? And the thing that, I was, uh, that struck me <coughs> um, was when I started writing about this and how it changed the production pipeline in Hollywood and how basically basically it was like a, a, a parallel universe or parallel community was built alongside the traditional filmmaking community and then the digital community sort of engulfed the traditional community and kind of took it over. And the thing that struck me as I was as I was talking to people about this subject was the was just how um, there was no there was no set plan, you know. There was no corporate strategy, you know. Like that, you know, there was no president going like, "Our goal is to create a computer animated film in ten years. We do this not because of it's easy, but because it's hard." I mean, that, that never happened, you know. Most of the computer graphics was done in guerrilla style. It was just invented under the table, uh, uh, on sidelines, people working on their own time, just doing stuff, you know. Like one of the earliest computer games, uh, the Magnavox Odyssey. 1972 was designed by a guy who was working for a company that did defense work, like targeting systems for guns during the Vietnam War. So like he had, they had a Pentagon contract. It was called Sanders and Associates, and uh, and New Hampshire, and, uh, and and basically this guy had an uh, had an exploration budget of about five million and about eight engineers, and and, and he was just sitting on a bus stop one day thinking, is there anything any good on TV? Why don't you do something with the TV other than just watch it? Like, why can't you play a game? <laughs> and then he just thought, well, I've got a budget. I've got a couple of engineers. Yeah, and he just put his, his people to work on it, you know, on a spare time. And the vice president would run into him and go, what are you doing? <laughs> like, don't you have better things to do? You know? But he invented the, one of the earliest computer games, you know, the, 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 it, and was one of the first consoles in 1972, and this was like a really big deal, you know. And then Nolan Bushnell, who started Atari, basically worked off the Magnavox Odyssey, like he saw the Odyssey and was so blown away, he was like, I want to do something like that, you know. And that's what sort of like the evolution of the games industry. But the thing that's fascinating is that, is that you can't trace a linear history of uh, computer graphics the way you can film. Like, like motion picture film, you got, okay, 
Edward Muybridge doing experiments at Stanford in the 1870s before there was even film. You know, George Eastman makes the role of celluloid film. But then, you know, of course, Edison. And then you have the first narrative films with Edmund Porter. And then the first movie studios. And, you know, then they moved to Hollywood. And, and it's a linear track. You can follow that track. But in order to understand CG, you know, there's not one Walt Disney guy, you know. It's not like George Lucas rubbed a lamp and Pixar come down. You know, <laughs> it, it didn't work that way. It's all separate threads, almost like the plot lines of a Russian novel. It's all these weird little, just like the, the military put a lot of money in uh, flight simulators and virtual reality in the 60s. And as much picture visual effects. And as independent filmmakers. And as hardcore academics. Uh, you know, as people working in the computer research department places. A lot of computer games, uh, uh, some of the early computer ga games were developed by people basically working in a larger, um, in, 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 in like working with like larger academic computers, and they basically were trying to come up with a program to demonstrate the sophistication of their, of their computer. Like, you know, back when they called them electronic brains. Electronic brains. Let's see what he can do. Look, he can play chess. Ooh, you know, <laughs> there was a guy in the 50s named uh, Wally Higginbotham um, who was working at, at, a, at a large um, uh, computer research lab back east, and, and, and he came up with like a primitive game of, of tennis, uh, just because you know when they had open house night at the laboratory, you know people get bored looking at charts of you know, uh, radioactive shelf lines and, <laughs> like, you know, rocket trajectory and stuff like that. So he came up with a tennis game just to give people something to do. And he says, I never thought of copywriting it because I just thought it was a piece of blood fluff. You know, I didn't think it would be actually be worth something, something. Which was, like, sort of, you know, sort of amazing. So really, it's like there's all these sort of separate threads that are all happening at the same time. And then, uh, and, and they're all working in, um, uh, in ignorance of one another. Like, they're really not, I mean, the games people didn't talk to the visual effects people, and the, 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 the uh, universities didn't talk to the Hollywood people. They were all on their separate worlds, you know, till about the mid to late 80s when things started to, you know, started to merge, and stuff started to come together. So, you have somebody like, like Edwin Catmull, um, Catmull was a protege of a guy named Ivan Sutherland. And Sutherland's an interesting fellow. Um, in 1962, uh, he was doing his graduate work. He was, he was on an ROTC program. And he was, and he was doing his, his doctoral thesis. And, and, and they had just declassified this large computer at, at MIT uh, because they, they had upgraded to a new system. So the government was like, do you want this? Okay. No. And it's called a, 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 a TX, uh, they call it the TXO, TX2. And, um, and what's interesting was, was that basically the, the people at, at the uh, university said, well, let the graduate students play with it, and we can tell the trustees, like, say we're using your money well. Uh, we're letting graduate students do it. <laughs> so they let Cat, uh, I'm sorry, they let Sutherland have this computer to himself, which was pretty unusual back then. In 1960, 62, the idea that you could have a computer by yourself was crazy. Computers were like the size of a bus, you know, they were gigantic, you know. And it took about eight people, you know, full-time operating. And because it, 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 uh, programs took so long to run, they developed a system called timeshare, which would go like 24 hours, which was just like have, you know, you, you would just block, uh, you know, book in a block of time um, to, to run your programs and then have to get out when the next group came. And, and that's the way to do stuff. Like, like here's an interesting question. Um, which was the, the very first Star Wars movie, right now they call it Star Wars, Star Wars 4, you know, like the new hello. And it's like, the, do, do you know how much CG is in it? Like, and how much actual computer graphics is in it? Mm -hmm. It's two scenes. <laughs> like, the scene at the end, when the, when the Rebel Commander is briefing Luke Skywalker and the other pilots how to blow up the Death Star, there's a black and white schematic uh, cutaway of the of the Death Star. It's it's like one minute uh, of, of not even not even a long thirty seconds of um, a, a black and white vector, which is just line, just black lines on white paper, uh, with no with no sound. And just to do that uh, took two weeks of rendering on a supercomputer at the University of Chicago. 
<laughs> it's like, it's just a red of the damn thing. <laughs> and it's a little bit when they're ta at the end, just before the Death Star blows up, and they're targeting Alderaan to like sort of like blow it up, you know, to blow up the uh, Prince Leia's planet. And um, and and, and the, the targeting system, you see the planet coming into go. That was an early system called Scanami, which was developed by a guy in in in, uh, in Denver uh, in the 1970s. And, and, and it's basically a, like a, 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 a digital uh, a, a video distortion where they would take the system for which you kind of mess with it, you know, for digital. But uh, that's it. That's it in all of Star Wars. Yeah. And my other favorite story is um, in 2001 A Space Odyssey, there's a shot where, um, where the HAL computer is telling the two astronauts that the, that the um, uh, uh, satellite dish on the spaceship is going to fail. It's going to malfunction and will be cut off with communications with the Earth. So you need to, you know, go outside and fix it. <laughs> like, like how it's like steam. And the thing is, um, Dr. Poole and uh, and, and uh, the, the other guy, Dr. L you know, Gary Lockwood, was was looking down at this computer screen, and you saw a beautiful wire frame, a wire frame of a of a computer dish, you know, the satellite dish turning 360. So it's just going around, you know, it's like you know, um, you know, sort of light vector lines on a dark blue screen. And it looks like a computer. You know? The way that was done is uh, the wireframe said it really is made out of wire. <laughs> it's like they had no capacity to be able to make the show up on, on film. So what they did was that the guy who designed the miniatures for the spaceships made a satellite dish out of chicken wire. <laughs> and they sprayed it white, <laughs> and stuck it on a record turntable, <laughs> and it this and turned it around. Yeah. while taking photographs of it. And then they made high con eggs of that mm -hmm. and put that under a down shoe animation camera. And then made a video of that and then had to optically put it into the TV screen. <laughs> so it's complete bull. It's complete made up, you know. But it looks good. I mean I was looking at it recently and you know, it still looks like a computer. Like it holds up. In fact, what do you think is the first uh, the first movie where computer screens were strong enough uh, like the the image on the uh, uh, on the display was powerful enough to actually read on motion picture film, because for a long time the the uh, just the luminosity and the number of bars and stuff was so weak that it wouldn't show up on film. It would just be black or it would just be like static with some frozen bars. They would have to optically put it in using traditional optical technique. You know, it's the first movie where you turn on the computer and you actually see what's on the computer. The Jurassic Park. That's the first time when Samuel Jackson turns on his computer, you're actually seeing what he's seeing. Because you know? all, every movie ever done before that, it always had to be optically put on later. The guys are just staring at blank screens, <laughs> and all that stuff is put on afterwards. You know, cool magic Hollywood. Like but I, I always found this kind of this stuff kind of fascinating, where all this stuff evolved from. So, so to get back to Sutherland, um, Sutherland, uh, you know, was given this computer at MIT to do like his last, his final year that he was thesis work on. And, uh, and, and he was very interested in graphics. And, and, and uh, what he did is that he wrote the very first software, the very first animation program, a thing called Sketchpad. And, uh, and Sketchpad uh, was like a very, a very primitive early system. And basically because it was an RTC program, he had to put a lot of military applications to it. Saying, oh, we can build bridges, and we can do this, and we can work out the trajectory of artillery shells or, you know, all that kind of stuff just to make them, the, the military guys happy. But the uh, reality, he wrote an animation program. And, and, and even, and, uh, and I read his, his paper and, and his, tre his treatise, and it's interesting because even inside the treatise at one point he says, uh, uh, a sketchpad need not be used only for uh, military purposes. For instance, I just want to make a cartoon. And he said, oh my goodness, here's like the first heartbeat of digital. You know, he was like the first beginning, you know. So, so, uh, so Sutherland graduated uh, in, in, uh, in 63. He, he, he fulfilled his ROTC program by working uh, uh, for the government for a program called uh, ARPA, which is an Advanced Research Projects Agency. So now it's called DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. But they're like basically the think tank for the, for the, for the government for like advanced programs all kinds of stuff. And in the 1960s, 
the government was putting a lot of money in virtual reality because they wanted flight simulators. Because, you know, the idea is like, you know, if you, like in the old days, a flight simulator was this, this thing the shape of a wooden phone booth with wings on it, and you got it, and, and like two guys with oars would rock you <laughs> while you try to pretend you're flying a plane. You know? <laughs> that was a simulator. You know? <laughs> During World War II, the, uh, the Disney company um, actually used to build toy miniatures in Japanese cities and, 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 and pull them underneath a, a, a bombardier site on a string. So the bombardiers could practice. You know, just like, so they were like, you know, <laughs> like, and that would be their program. And you know, and that's that was simulated. But as we got into this, into the jet age, they thought we need we need better we need better uh, you know training programs. Like you know things like they were trying to figure out. Okay, we know a propeller plane can land on an aircraft carrier in the middle of the ocean on a rolling deck, but can a supersonic jet? go from like Mach 1 and, and land on an aircraft carrier on a, on, you know, in the mid-ocean. Well, before we get a real plane and a real aircraft carrier, which would be really messy if it doesn't work, let's work out a simulator. And so this time period of the, of the late 50s in, through the 60s till about 1973 was like a, a period where the, uh, where the military was investing a lot in, in virtual reality and computer graphics. Because, you know, when, when a pilot turns his, his, his control, the ground has to move at the same time, you know, at, in real time. And that, that sort of calculation of graphics in those days was really, really hard. I mean, that was, that was uh, you know, um, um, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of pixels re-adjusting re uh, themselves, so, you know, instantaneously. Of course, now we have millions of pixels. But back then, it was just like thousands. You know. <coughs> so, so this this period coincided with a low period in Hollywood, which is the 1960s. You know, the the, movie, the great movie studios, the first generation of movie moguls who had sort of you know created all the great golden age movies were at nearing retirement age. They were all leaving now. You know, I think Jack Warner retired in 1967. Um, Daryl Sandick of Fox in 1970. Um, and so in the 60s, they were also basically leaving and you know, checking out. And the next generation was taking over. And the Hollywood studios, from being you know, omnipotent and paramount, had, had kind of fallen into like a, 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 a slow period because people were staying home watching television. You know, you know, people weren't going. To, like people used to go to the movies to see the newsreels and see cartoons and see, uh, you know, you know, it's the only time you could eat if you wanted to see President Roosevelt. You know, you, you went to the movie theater because there'd be a newsreel of President Roosevelt or Hitler or Gandhi or Churchill or something. That's so when you saw this stuff. Now you saw it on television. So like, why don't you do that? You know? So uh, uh, attendance in movie theaters dropped sharply into the 50s and then going into the 60s. And a lot of these movie studios were being independent operations were slowly being sucked up by multinational conglomerates, you know, like Universal, you know, became part of Gulf and Western for a while. And yeah, 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 and you know, uh, Warner Brothers is Time Warner, you know, from what the time I was in. So they just didn't have the kind of money to invest in in uh, in, in, in explorative what they call. Uh, it, you know, in, in this case, they used to call it blue sky research. And blue sky research was you went to a computer, uh, you, you know, you went to an investor and you said, give us four million dollars in two years and we will bring you back something really cool. <laughs> it may not be exactly what you wanted, but it will be really cool. Because <laughs> it was hard to explain, you know, where the stuff was going, you know. Like, like there was one guy who invested, um, invested millions in, uh, uh, in, in creating a, a uh, computer-operated pogo stick, which is kind of like silly. It sounds ridiculous. But what they learned from the balancing of the pogo stick, they put into the balancing gyros of the wheels of the Mars rover so that the thing could go over a regular ground and not fall over or something or break. So it sounds ridiculous, but it does have an application. Just like they say, you know, the space program you know, you know, the space program created, you know, the joke is always Velcro or Tang, you know, which is arguable. But it did create scratch resistant lenses. <laughs> and, and those mylar blankets that we all wear, you know, you know Velcro, things like that all came out of the space program. Plus, uh, you know, the, the, 
the, the computer on the uh, on the LEM module, the lunar module from 1969, is one of the earliest, you know, sort of like, you, you could call it a personal computer, but sort of like a mini computer. You know, considering all the computers before that was the size of a bus, this is actually the size of like a, a small ice chest. <laughs> that was like that was like a big deal, you know. So, so basically, in, in the 60s, a lot of this stuff, um, yeah, a, a lot of the focus was on government work, and a lot of studios did government. I mean, you know, Pixar did some government. Um, a lot of places did government. Work. You know, it may not have been purely military, it might have been space. You know, like uh, the Cosmos series that's up right now. Um, uh, a, a lot of the scientists working at JPL, uh, a guy named Jim Glenn, who was a um, who was a who was a, a lead researcher in computer graphics, who had gone to school under Ivan Sutherland and alongside Ed Catmull. Th th that's why I find, like, I find all the connections fascinating. You know. So Blinn, uh, went to, uh, instead of getting into the commercial business, went into the Jet Propulsion Lab, which he loved JPL. And one of the things that he was hired to work on was the, was the Voyager spacecraft simulations. Because like they fired Voyager to the outer planets around 1977. And it took like about three to four years to reach anything interesting. So they have about three or four years, <laughs> and then they go, well, what if the thing gets there and the camera doesn't work? <laughs> or what if, like, the broadcasting doesn't work? Yeah. I mean, uh, well, about five years ago, uh, the European Space Agency shot this advanced probe at Mars, and it got all the way to Mars, and you know, it, it broke. <laughs> like, the camera didn't work, and it hit the planet, and just kind of, oops. <laughs> so the JPL people were worried. They were saying, well, what if the thing gets there and it doesn't work? You know. We have to explain to everybody, you know, what we just spent, you know, four billion dollars on. <laughs> so they wanted Blin to come up with a simulation of um, of what the Voyager spacecraft was doing, you know. And uh, Blin told me he said he, he said we actually didn't have a storyboard or a script. We just had the the, the flight program. <laughs> he said the flight plan was our storyboard. So that's what we went by. And the great thing is that Blin, when he was in college, made friends. With all these uh, with all these engineers who would later become the engineer along with Pixar, who would become all the top Pixar guys, and and they were all still in school. So uh, a lot of them went to work for the New York Institute of Technology in New York, where there was this rogue millionaire named uh, uh, named, uh, named Dr. Alexander Shore, who in 1975 wanted to create a CG movie. It was like impossible, <laughs> you know, but the fact is he had a lot of money and he wanted to try. So he bankrolled this, 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 this huge effort to try to create a computer-generated movie 20 years before Toy Story. So like 20 years earlier, you know. But that's where Ed Catmull, who was the CEO of, of Pixar and the CEO of the Walt Disney Company, and also a student of Ivan Sutherland. Yeah, where are you uh, now? You know, that's all these guys all met. Yeah. We've been working for, uh, you know, uh, Working on the subject, yeah, I'm here, Dave. But working at, you know, at, and learning from him when he was a teacher at the university. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so when Blin was designing the the Voyager films, he had access to these engineers who was sort of going from job to job. Uh, I have, and I they have were on their way to go I have three passes. Lucas, Lucas uh, uh, you, you know, uh, this is like shortly after Star Wars. It was around eight, yeah. seven, eight, seven, nine. Um, and, and, and the great thing about the Voyagers, and you can, yes, you can look it up on YouTube, look up the Voyager 2 flyby uh, video, and you see these things, they're beautiful. Right. They're really, really well done. Because instead, yeah, you've got these Pixar engineers, and, and Blin himself is an exceptional you know, a, a, a software engineer. And, you know, and, and they don't if, if you're familiar with uh, computer graphics today, like Maya and all, there's a, there's a program called Blin Shader, and that's his. You know, that's one of his program. It was all about surfacing raster graphics. You know. <coughs> but the great thing about the Voyager films was that up to that time, the only way you could see a computer-generated film was um, was was usually like you know you had to go to a, uh, an avant-garde film festival, you know, or some sort of science fair or something like that. I mean, the computer graphics community, as it was slowly building had their own conventions and their own sort of like things like SIGGRAPH and you know, all of that. But, uh, but for the general public, nobody saw this stuff. But the crazy about the Voyager films is they were on the evening news. 
you put on Dan Rather or, uh, you know, or Roger Mudd or something, you know, this CBS News, and it's like, what's the voyage of spacecraft do? You know, and they would run on this clip, and it's beautiful. It's really, really compelling. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, and I remember seeing it in the 80s and thinking, thinking, you know, who's got the camera? <laughs> if that's the computer, what are they doing? You know, it's amazing. You know? And, uh, so, all these sort of facets all, all led towards the creation of computer graphics. And, you know, and, and the, 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 the building of, um, you know, the evolution of game technology also went hand in hand with this, because some of the earliest games were basically just flight simulators. I think on Microsoft in 1980 uh, uh, published like one of its earliest games was flight simulator. <laughs> and it's all basically what well, simulator. You know, the they've done all the hard work for um, uh, one scientist told me, he said, the major tools in the creation of computer graphics were basically developed between 1976 and about 1982. That's when they came up with the main tools. But then the next 10 years was making the, the power, uh, you know, making it powerful enough to, uh, you know, to, to, cr to create more uh, advanced graphics. And then also making them friendly enough so dummy artists like me you know, <laughs> can, can operate these things. You know, you know like it, it back then, it, it, you know, you needed a, a you know a degree in physics and a, you know electronics to just be able to turn on your computer, you know, just be able to put your program. In. You know, like it was a big deal in 1984 when uh, when when Steve Jobs took his Macintosh computer out of a box. You know, it was a commercial. He takes it out of a box, puts it on the table, plugs it in, and hits the button on. <laughs> uh, that was the, that never happened before. You had to do any access codes. You had to do entry codes. You had to you had to write code for every program. You know, you would go to conventions of other computer enthusiasts, and um, instead of the way you share programs was that everybody had a little notepad, and what they would do is they would write code, and carry it off, and say, try this, <laughs> try that, and that's the way you shared stuff with one another. You know, that, that's the way it worked. Before. So it was kind of so it was kind of crazy. Yeah, that way. But the interesting thing was that, you know, and that uh, and also slowly building up the power. Like um, the experiment done at, at New York Institute of Technology with this millionaire, um, Catmull told me that, that he and, and this guy named Alvy Ray Smith, who also was like one of the, uh, the two of them developed Alpha Channel together. Does everyone understand what Alpha Channel is? It's a specific program. It, it tells the computer about solids and objects. So it's like, so it's like it has to tell the computer, um, I'm sitting in a chair. I can't put my hand through the chair. Uh, you know, my, you know, the table's behind me. You're in front of me. You know, you, you know, like I can't pass through a solid because the computer would not like it wouldn't understand it. So it basically explains the like what we call the levels. It shows where the different levels are of uh, of that that's inside an image. So that became important. And then, and then again, also was that thing of, you know, uh, uh, so Alvin and, and Ed were talking about, um, Alvin and Ed were talking about that, that if they had tried to attempt this computer animated film in 1975, they, uh, they said just to render it, like nothing else, just to render the frames, would have taken seven years of 24 hours a day, <laughs> seven day weeks. <laughs> Like, this is crazy, it can't be done. <laughs> like, um, uh, does anybody know, what was, the fir what was the first movie, what was the first movie in which, uh, like, all, all the special effects were done by a computer instead of miniatures or toys? That, that's a good, good guess. Yeah, yeah, but Tron still had a lot of traditional stuff. First one's called The Last Starfighter. No, no, no. Jeff Oak in 1984, you know, and, and uh, I think like, the old actor Robert Preston was in it. So you can still see it once in a while. But uh, it was a very simple movie, but it, uh, uh, it, 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 yeah, it was all about a kid gets recruited by this alien race to go be a fighter pilot in outer space. Um, but the fun part about it was that, was that they said when they did 1984, they said when they were doing it, they had two supercomputers, like, like doing their rendering, and, the, and, and all their co computational power combined was 34 megabytes. 
So they made the entire movie on 34 million. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like insane. You know? <laughs> like, now you can get like six gigs at the cash register for like nine ninety five. I actually remember in 2003 buying my first flash drive here and like was downstairs. Like, the first flash drive was 356 and it cost me $80. Right? Oh my goodness. Yeah, you know, so that's why things just keep growing. Yeah, it's this thing that, that they call it, um, they call it Moore's Law. And Moore's Law means as the technology improves, uh, things get smaller and cheaper. So, yeah, I mean, like the first, um, the first flat screen TVs were like, were like, what was it, they were like $25,000, $40,000 each, you know, to get a flat screen TV. Now you can get a pretty nice one for under thousand bucks. I know this big stuff just comes down. But what's interesting is the period that I uh, that I refer to as, as the digital revolution, really like the, like when you think of like the digital revolution, is really about 1989 to about 1995. And that's really kind of like the high period because you start with like like Terminator 2, you know, uh, uh, you know with the with the, the metal guy who turns into liquid goes through things and stuff. That was like a huge breakthrough. You know, a lot of the effects come on that. And then afterwards, you had Beauty and the Beast. You had all of them sequels. You know, so that's a big deal at the time. And then Jurassic Park. And then finally Toy Story. And, and, and so all those movies happened within this like four year, five year period. And, 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 and the difference is basically, before those movies, if you were to go to a movie studio and say, I want to make a movie using computers, they say that's ridiculous. But after those movies, if you said, I want to make a movie without a computer, that was ridiculous. <laughs> and that's really the changeover happened at that time. One of the producers who worked on the, uh, worked on the Starfighter film told me last year, she says, my final revenge is, I could go outside right now, stop everybody on the street, and go, you know what CGI is? Yeah, you know that? It's 1984. Nobody knew what you were talking about. <laughs> it was like Flash Gordon speak. <laughs> you know? And I love that stuff. You know, I love when people can see the future and like nobody else can. It's just this kind of amazing thing. You know? Like, uh, to take it back even further, in 1945, right, at the end of World War II, there was a guy named Vannevar Bush. No relation. <laughs> to those, to those people. But um, there's a guy named Vannevar Bush, and he's the dean of, uh, of engineering uh, uh, at uh, MIT. And, uh, and, and he wrote this uh, 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 article in the magazine Harper's called As We May Think. And, and Bush had been experimenting with Charles Babbage's differential engines, and you know, the, the Victorian concept of, of computer, and where we get steampunk from. And uh, anyway, so Bush in this article, he didn't even have the name computer yet. He didn't have a word for it. He called it a memex. He said, someday you're going to have this thing called a memex on your desk at home. And all the information of all the libraries in the world will be at your fingertips. And you're going to write your friend's letters and you're gonna send each other messages. And you're going to scan pictures and send each other movie clips back to 1945, okay. and and you know, and this is like total Buck Rogers stuff. This is total science fiction, like unbelievable, you know. But the interesting thing is, is um, a lot of uh, this sort of computer development, people would say somebody would would, would theorize that something is possible, and then the next generation of scientists try to figure out a way to make it happen. So Bush said this is possible. Then one of the people who read this magazine. Uh, was a guy named Douglas Engelbart, and, and Engelbart was staying in a in a, um, uh, was a, a, a a hospital in Manila, recovering from wounds from World War II. He was in a military hospital in Manila, and he picks up his magazine and reads it, and he gets so inspired and stuff. He gets so amazed by this that uh, he later becomes the the dean of of, um, of, uh, of uh, engineering electronics at Stanford, and he invents the mouse. And then in 1968, there's this thing they call the mother of all demos, where what he did, and, and again, you can look this up on YouTube, look up video of the mother of all demos. And, and, and Engelbart, in, in 1968 at Stanford, demonstrates the first workstation. 
And he goes like, you know, I've got a keyboard, I've got a monitor, I've got a printer, <laughs> like, and I have an internet hooked up with, with people 40 miles away. They use, they use telephone lines, which is why Engelbert's the guy who coined the term online. You say online. Because it's from telephones. So it's like to be on the, on the telephone. Um, but, but in 68, he did a demonstration that maybe this is possible. You know, maybe this can happen. And what's interesting is one of the people at the demonstration was a guy, was, a, uh, was this guy named Alan Kay. And Alan Kay, he was a Brentwood. Um, but what's interesting was that, was that uh, Kay saw this demonstration and, 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 uh, and was so inspired by it that he sort of became, got into computer science. And at the University of Minnesota, he saw an early demonstration the second year of one of the earliest flat screens, like an early plasma screen, but they had an experimental version of the University of Minnesota. So he theorized the idea of a laptop computer. He said, someday we're going to have computers that you can get in your suitcase. You know? And he said, when he started to work at Xerox Park years ago, when his first job, you know, uh, people at Xerox Park said, uh, it was Palo Alto Research Center. They said, uh, so what would you like to do here? Because I, I, I want to have the personal computer. And they went, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what's amazing is that these people all inspire one. They all kind of leave, you know. And uh, Kay is kind of a fascinating guy because Kay was the guy who, he was reading the trades that uh, Steve Lisberg, this independent producer, uh, was going to do the film for Disney called Tron which was the, you know, the idea about a guy who <coughs> sucked into a video game. And Kay is the one who called this bird and said, well, if you're going to do a movie about computer, you know, like the graphics inside a computer, you should use computer graphics. And this bird was like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> He's a fascinating guy. He's also the guy who, um, right after Steve Jobs got kicked out of the championship of Apple in 1986, like he was kicked out for a little while. He was overwhelmed by his own voice. And, uh, and he was really angry about it. And Kay and, and, and Jobs had like a vegetarian lunch in Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. They went for a walk. And Kay told him, says, you know, I heard George Lucas was going to sell his computer graphics division. You should pick it up. You might have fun. That's Pixar. <laughs> that's where Pixar came from. You know, that's the origin. So, um, how are we doing on time? Um, yeah, I'm go for about a minute. So anyway, yeah. So I, I mean, the interesting thing about Pixar is that is that um, is that it started as this, this small group of engineers working at New York Tech, and then and then after you know Lucas and Star Wars and all, they left New York Tech and then and, and then regrouped you know in, in, uh, in, uh, in the Bay Area to work with George Lucas, and Lucas's thing was that. He wanted post-production in film uh, digitized because at that time, it, it, you know, you know, the way editors worked was you had your movieola, which is like this little machine that that ran footage with several reels, and it would run stuff into a into a canvas bag, you know, and then you pull out the film, and you had all these little strips of film hanging from little wires all around. Pick it up. Yeah. You know the you know the way they used to count a, a close up in in, in, in the uh, early movie days was you would hold the film up to your nose and roll like this, <laughs> and that was a close up. <laughs> 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 like, that's how you used to me that's how you used to measure close up. Right? Okay. Um, and, uh, and 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 optical work was like let's say I want to put somebody. Let's say I want to put somebody in a in a Roman city like Pompeii or underneath a volcano. So what you would do is that you would film somebody against black. Then you would then you would film this toy city, this little miniature city, and the area where the humans going to be, you would, you would have a little black painted out area there where the person is going to be. And then there's a thing called an optical printer, which was a large box which ran the two strips of film together and then a third camera photographed that and, and combined it. So you saw the person and the whole city, you know, inside the little city. And that's how that's how visual effects were done since about nineteen eight till about uh, when did that become I was it was like nineteen ninety three or nineteen ninety four. So about ninety years. That's the way that's the way it was done. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, so George Lucas wanted that digitized. But that was a really very expensive, very complicated process mm -hmm. you know, back then. Uh, and, and, and he put all these Pixar engineers to work on it. But then after they did that, basically, like the Pixar guys wanted to make films. They wanted to make animation and movies and stuff. And George really just wanted post-production, more editing and all post stuff done. But once that was done, he was happy. So the, so the Pixar people were kind of like straining at the leash, like they wanted to do something. So what, when Steve Jobs picked them up, Jobs' thing was, he didn't really want to make film at the he, he wanted He wanted color graphics on computers. He wanted people to, like, he said, everybody should go home, have a computer at, at their home, and should have color graphics on them. Which at the time, color was very expensive in the early 1990s. Um, but the, the Pixar engine people themselves, you know, wanted to do something with 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 uh, animation. They wanted to do something with film, and, uh, and and they did, you know, like when they did the, the Genesis effect in Star Trek II, uh, the Wrath of Khan. They basically called that our 60-second audition of George. Like we basically wanted to show George what we could do with it. But they said originally, when Paramount Pictures said, um, we want to sh demonstrate this 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 special. Uh, you know, program on this this bomb or something that when it hits a planet, it grows an atmosphere and grows life and trees and stuff all over. And he said the Paramount guys would have been happy if we showed time lapse moss growing on a rock. It, they would have been thrilled, you know. And they did this amazingly complicated technique where they go around the planet, basically all the stuff they learned from the Voyager, from doing the Voyager stuff, of the of the camera going low alongside. You know, because they said at one point, they said, who says the camera has to be locked down? Why can't the camera move with the ease in which, like, the spaceships are moving out? So it's, it feels like a feels like a spacecraft skimming the surface of the planet. So they, they put all that stuff into it. And, 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 you know, and George was, was impressed and stuff, but still not enough to trust people with, the, with their own film, you know. Uh, like, even, you know, when they finally, were, when they broke away and they started to be winning awards, like when they got, uh, when they hired John Lasseter, uh, you know, and Lasseter had started to work for the company as a full-time artist and filmmaker, John understood, it was about 1986 or John understood the limitations of the medium, which is like the scientists right away wanted to do full-on human beings. You know, they wanted to do live action people, which is, in, it's still hard today. I mean, there's a lot of talk now about digitizing Philip Seymour Hoffman for the last few hundred years. Because apparently he had a very important part in the last two movies. So it's like, now he's gone. So can we digitally stick him in or something? Whatever. I mean, before this, in the 1950s, the famous movie, Play Night from Outer Space, uh, the vampire, uh, Bela Lugosi, died halfway through the movie. So they took his chiropractor. <laughs> and see, if you put on a cane and go like this. <laughs> see, he's walking around. <laughs> So this is a little better. <laughs> it's going to be better, yeah. but still, human beings is still a really hard thing to do. But John, in, in, in the '80s, realized let's work to the limitations of the medium. So if the objects are shiny and hard and all, and, you know, let's make toys. Okay, so like tin toy and like Luxo Jr. And um, uh, we have problems with weight, so that the uh, figures look like they're actually standing on the ground or occupying the space. Let's make fish. Well, <laughs> like, let's do bugs. You know, because bugs have exoskeletons and everything, and they, they look good. You know, to do that. And it wasn't until The Incredibles that they really did full on human beings. And when they did The Incredibles, the idea was instead of trying to do photo real looking human beings, let's do the kind of human beings Disney did in the 60s, about 101 Dalmatians. You know, films like that, where it, 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 it feels, you know, you know, like it's still a cartoon stylization, but it's of, of realistic people. So it looks close enough, you know, it, you know to be real. And, you know, and the results speak for themselves. You know, they, they, were, they were very successful. So, where computer graphics is going in the future, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, to see where it evolves. I mean, the thing I find so fascinating about it is that Ivan Sutherland, the guy who wrote the first animation program, is still alive. He just retired, you know, a few years ago. But he's still around. So we've gone in one lifetime, we've gone from little glowing lines on a black inch, four inch by four inch screen, to
to Avatar and Pacific Rim and you know all these things it's all in one lifetime that's incredible really you know, you know and the real super development of CG was like about 1986 to the present it's like when they're really kind of like all that like really you know strong development is taken so in another lifetime who knows um, I talked to one computer pioneer and I said where do you think it's going and he says well in the last hundred years the only thing that hasn't changed since, uh, since Lumiere since like 1900 is the screen we're still looking at a flat sheet on the wall maybe that's the next thing you know. I don't know it'll be interesting to watch and I think that's a good point. Yeah. well thank you very much thank you all for coming Every time. And the book available? Yeah. It's time.